Hello, welcome back to 40 Days of the Fathers. We're on day 10, and this is Ignatius's letter to the Smyrnians. I hope I'm saying that right. There it is, just in case. <laughs> Speaking of saying things right, um, this letter is a defence against the her heresy of what I've been calling docketism. I looked it up because I didn't feel like I was saying it right. Apparently it's docetism. So, um, there you go. <laughs> you read these things so much that I never actually say them out loud. And apparently I've been saying it wrong. So, it's this letter is a against the heresy of docetism, and it also gives a strange little insight about evil spirits, which we'll get to in a minute. <clears throat> so the, the opening chapters of this letter pulls no punches in regards to the heresy of docetism. Ignatius commands, uh, commends this church for being fully persuaded in the truth of Christ. He was born of a virgin, was baptised, and truly did suffer and die on the cross for us. Not as some were saying that he only seemed to suffer. To these, Ignatius says, they only seem to be Christians because of their false teaching. He gets a bit snarky in this one. He defends the resurrection by telling of how the apostles ate and drank with and touched the risen Christ since he was still possessed of flesh. But to this he also adds him that he believes Jesus is still possessing a body of flesh whilst being spiritually united to the Father. So I'm not sure if he means this in the same way we might today when we talk about the glorified or resurrected bodies, since you don't often hear people say they are flesh in the physical human sense, but that's likely just a semantics issue. Because we, I say we all, those we are orthodox in our belief of the resurrection, believe that we are going to resurrect back into our bodies, but in a glorified sense. Um, defining what glorified means is another matter, but if it's like Jesus, which he's the first fruits of the resurrection, so we should be following how he was resurrected. And in other things where Jesus says we'd be like the angels, they obviously have bodies which have some kind of physicality, or flesh, just maybe not mortal flesh that ages and hurts and dies. So with regard to the regards to the unbelievers who taught that Jesus wasn't really in the flesh, Ignatius gave, gives us a strange insight into a belief about where evil spirits come from, possibly. Because they teach that Jesus only seemed to have a real body after his resurrection, so these people will only seem to as well. They will essentially reap what they sow and shall be divested of their bodies and be mere evil spirits. So that is an in, definitely an intriguing insight. I'm not sure how common this belief was in the early church or whether it's actually the implication that Ignatius meant or if he was just sort of having wordplay that because they seem to say this, they will seem to be something else. Um, he doesn't really go into it, he just sort of leaves that there. But he goes on to say there's still hope for these people, and by extension, yeah, anyone today who preaches this heresy, or any heresy I suppose, stay away from them, Ignatius says, and only pray to God for these people, so that they may be brought to repentance, although this will be very difficult, he says, but Jesus has the power to make this happen if he wills. So, essentially, if people are preaching heresy, keep away from them and pray for them. I hope that God opens their eyes to their error and come back to the truth. Following on for this, from this, there is a comment about this belief in regards to the Eucharist and how these unbelievers say that it is not the flesh of our Saviour Jesus Christ, an early reference to the doctrine of the real presence, or transubstantiation maybe. Um, if those are new words to you, that basically means that Jesus is really present in the bread and wine, either in a uh, spiritual, metaphysical way, in and under and with the bread, as I think Calvin said, or Luther rather, and um, or in the Roman Catholic sense that the bread and wine 
transubstantiate into the flesh and blood while still appearing to be bread and wine. Um, these doctrines have their roots in these early texts which speak of the bread and wine as truly flesh and blood of Jesus but not necessarily defining it so explicitly. Um, either way, the heretics taught that the bread and wine were not the flesh and blood and were condemned for it, which obviously has implications on those today who hold that these are merely symbols with no presence at all. It's just memorialism, as it's called, um, which is very typical in a Baptist church or non-denominational type. Um, if there's any weight to Ignatius' words, or to early doctrine, then um, that should give us pause for thought. Uh, it's yeah, definitely something to ponder on and think about. And it definitely caused me to reconsider some of my views on the Communion, on the Eucharist, after reading these texts. And uh, recently there was a video shared around of Francis Chan, who had read similar, or this actual one, I think, and had been challenged on his views on the Eucharist and communion and what it means and what it is, even. So, um, if you're interested in that, you can Google it or look at my blog, ancientfaith.uk, where I recently posted a article about that one. I'll stick it in the link below as well, in the description. Um, the closing chapters are similar to the other letters. They praise the bishop, his friend Polycarp in this instance, and the church for their faith, and also for being steadfast against the heresies which Ignatius condemns. Whilst the previous letters all say the same thing about listening to the bishop and to not do anything apart from him, this letter goes one further and says that he who does anything without the knowledge of the bishop does in reality serve the devil. So. Some strong words there it really shows the emphasis on church hierarchy in these early days or maybe just in ignatius's mind as well as the serious positions of these church leaders as though they were acting in place of jesus and the apostles to the, in, to the individual church gatherings which is often how ignatius describes it which is probably why he's quite strong on observing the teaching and rule of the bishop because to him, they were acting in place of Jesus, being there with them. So like the other letters, this letter of Ignatius gives us a, a glimpse of where certain doctrines had their origins. And it, also, and it really offers some interesting viewpoints to think about that could potentially challenge your own beliefs as well, as it did me. So that's the end of that, that one. Um, Okay, all of Ignatius' letters are very short. I mean, you can read them probably in about 20 minutes, maybe, if that. I'd recommend you go and find new texts to read them, rather than just relying on what I'm saying. Um, they are, they're short. There's a lot, there's only seven or eight of them. Um, yeah, they're very, they're very, very interesting. And because they're so early, like, beginning of the second century um, it gives us a good insight to how the churches were running and working and how Christians believed and acted so early on in church history which even if you don't accept what they're saying and doing at least just the interest sake of knowing how our faith has progressed over these centuries it's interesting just from that point of view but maybe that's just because I'm a bit of a nerd. <laughs> so anyway, that's the end of this one. I hope you liked it and found it interesting. So if so, please, you know, thumb up the video, subscribe to me, support me on Patreon, support me by buying the book. See you next time.